Scott McLeod, World University School like MIT OpenCourseWare in five languages. We'd like to be in all 200 countries' official languages. With uh, Wikipedia in 298 languages, we'd like to be in all living languages for uh, schools that will use the Open Teaching and Learning Tool. Okay. Hi, sorry, I'm back here. Uh, Josh Weiss, I work at the IT department here at the Seattle School of Education. I was a literature teacher for seven years. Now I help design and develop education technology. And you don't have to go into that if you want. Yeah, just a, a little over a year. Okay, yeah. great. Well, welcome. Thank you very much. Good to have you come all the way upstairs. It's a great hike. <laughs> <laughs>
started for me uh, about 30, 27 years ago when I did my master's and undergrad and master's in computer science. I worked as a software engineer for about a decade before I got into uh, education. And I started with a master's at a Harvard Graduate School of Education. And, and there was my first exposure to, I won't use the word exposure, one of Roy's, <laughs> Roy's and Smithon. Uh, okay, where I first experienced children and computing at the MIT Media Lab, working with a lifelong kindergarten group there. And um, my journey into uh, serious research as a scholar began there in 2009 when I joined the PhD program in Learning Sciences and Technology Design. Roy was my advisor. I also worked closely with Dan Schwartz, who's now the dean here, and Richard Barron, and all of them continue to be wonderful mentors and now sometimes collaborators, and so that's wonderful. Since the last five or six years, I have worked on several NSF and other grant uh, funded research into computer science and education and computational thinking. And it's, it's wonderful as you see my journey that it brings together my areas of in interest and expertise beautifully well. So, but I do think about this a lot. I do like to stay close to practice. Um, I do like to work with, with teachers. I do like to share my work, not only at research conferences, but also conferences that bring together educators, pra practitioners, and researchers like SIGSI, yeah, rather than just ISER, which is the Computer Education Research Conference. I volunteer for the Computer Science Teachers Association, for the ACN Education Council. I work with school districts that are trying to roll out um, computer science education. So, you know, it, it just feels like even though you're doing research, you want it to have some sort of see impact in a more direct way. So I thank Daniel for this opportunity. I'm also working with teacher education, educators and teacher education programs here at this point. So, um, uh, my experiences with computing and children actually start, started in informal settings, but it very quickly moved, and starting with my dissertation work here at Stanford, it moved into more formal. That's a very pixelated picture. I'm looking at it, it looks much sharper here on the <laughs> screen, sorry. So, um, so computer science for all in schools, in K-12 learning has become a huge movement. CS for all is literally a buzzword. It's literally a hashtag on it these days. And there is, um, you know, uh, several reasons for it. For me, the best rationale is it's a new skill for a new age. And and I, I recently, I'm not going to, it's a, it's a link to an article uh, where I've talked about computational thinking skill as the fifth C of, of 21st thing, uh, century skills, in addition to critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication, computational thinking is, is basically impacting all disciplines. We had this um, uh, convening the other day about the integration into the sciences. And so, you know, with computing being as pervasive as, as it is, it just doesn't make sense for children to go through an entire K-12 journey not knowing very much about it at all. And the Facebook hearings give you a fantastic example for why everybody needs to understand <laughs> how these things work. work. <laughs> oh my god, yes. So uh, there is also an equity imperative. Uh, and, and again, this links to actually uh, the part of the K-12 CS framework. I was involved in, in framing that. Uh, I was part of the team that-, that This is the uh, California? No, CS3 this was the national one, which was led by ACM, CSTA, and Code.org. Um, yes, it's influenced, and several states that are not doing it on, for themselves have adopted those standards for now. So it is a national K-12 CS framework, and there is an entire section on why equity is important. It is, it's basically a discipline that has traditionally marginalized minorities and, and uh, women, and, and like that's science, problematic. Like math. Like science, like math, but perhaps the worst of all. I have this graph that you know shows the APCS, uh, the AP exams, and you know the percentage of, of uh, women and minorities that take the exam. exam. CS has, is now changing because of you know various initiatives, but it was even worse than physics you know, <coughs> uh, uh, at, at the bottom there. And and another reason for the equity imperative, we all know that you know we need representation in technology, Silicon Valley and the issue of women in tech and minorities in tech have been written about a fair bit, but there is also, uh, 
an economic opportunity there. And so with, with, with CS being sort of the highest paying jobs, the most lucrative jobs, the jobs that where you know, you're pushing on innovation using computer science, even if it's not a computer science job per se, but it is in the sciences, you earn a lot more. And so if certain groups are not sort of being, uh, uh, are not party to it, they're basically losing out on, on a big up, uh, economic opportunity. And then of course, there are a lot of open computer science boards. And Eric Roberts could have a whole talk on this <laughs> issue <laughs> and, and how we are not able to sort of keep up with this even at, at the higher ed level, but uh, um, there you have it. And so, um, you know, being a learning scientist though and having training in the learning sciences, I've just put up this slide that it's one of Roy's slides. Uh, not everybody understands the learning sciences. It's a pretty fairly young discipline. Uh, we focus on a lot of these issues of curriculum design, design of learning in formal and formal settings, instruction methods and all of those things. And so uh, a lot of my work, even as I do work in understanding computational thinking and computer science education, what it should look like, a lot of it is about this kind of design work. And in this context, I've been influenced a lot by a couple of very foundational frameworks in, in the learning sciences. One of them comes from How People Learn. There's a How People Learn part two that is uh, about to be released. Um, but uh, you know, it, it, it basically underscores this idea that any design for learning needs to be taking into account the learner, what needs to be taught, knowledge centered, and also you know, measuring, measuring that learning and giving feedback to the learner and all of this is sort of situated in the context of the classroom, of course, but the school and the community. And so you have to be paying attention to all of those issues. There is a newer framework that is that is a, a lot, um, that is, I think, better suited uh, to 21st century jargon and language. But again, it's sort of, it, it's similar, but it, 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 it underscores the need for attending to disciplinary mastery, cognitive uh, development in, in that domain, critical thinking and problem solving, but also interpersonal and intrapersonal things like you know mindset and assistance and, and, and in intrapersonal we talk about collaboration and communication and, and again it goes back to those 21st century skills that we talk about. And we feel that it's all of these things are necessary for deeper learning and deeper transferable um, uh, learning in whatever domain it is. And so my research agenda has sort of, you know, stood on three pillars. I don't expect you to read all of it. It's, it's, I would have blown up parts of it, but basically it involves design of learning environments, assessment design, and looking at process. And, and these are several projects where, you know, the color coding sort of suggests what are the things that I'm mainly looking at in those contexts. And, and just focus to give on you, secondary, meaning high school computer science. Yes, most of my work has been in the context of not just high school, middle and high school. I think secondary is, uh, is, is sixth grade and up. Um, but one of my research projects, recent research projects in the STEM plus computing program looks at pre-K learners. And so it, it's definitely sort of covering the gamut, but for the most part in the last two years it's been middle and high school, and just to give a sense for what, you know, just put some sort of um, images to this, uh, I've looked at computational discourse and how that might, you know, impact the development of computational thinking skills. I've looked at, this was my dissertation work, actually designing a curriculum, an entire uh, curriculum for middle school computer science, focusing on computational thinking and algorithmic thinking skills, which was for middle school, and, and um, you know, thinking about learning in contexts where the teacher may not have a, a very deep understanding of computer science, which was sort of a course in a box on Stanford Open edX for blended in-class learning. And it focused on trying to achieve deeper learning of computer, computing concepts. And it touched upon things like even broader perspectives of computing and core disciplinary ideas and also practices. Uh, which which go which is sort of aligned to the science practice science framework and, and other you know STEM frameworks these days where you look at all these kinds of things. Um, this project led to another project that uh, while I was at SRI, um, it's sort of ending now, but was focused on specific concepts within programming that children usually find very difficult to grasp, uh, novice learners, 
find difficult to grasp. And, and this actually looked at how to uh, combine non-programming um, and unplugged activities with programming activities to, for deeper conceptual learning. Here's the science piece. This is one blown up piece of that job. This is basically bringing computational modeling into a high school physics classroom um, and designing learning and assessment there. Um, assessment alone of computational thinking for the exploring computer science curriculum. This was again a project that, was, that SRI had been funded for and it used the evidence-centered design framework. This was a project where I actually learned a very robust assessment framework, uh, which has uh, stood me in good stead since. Um, and I've also looked at implementation factors in districts uh, around curricula like exploring computer science, which is a high school curriculum, teacher preparation around the Teach for America project. Here locally, I've worked very closely with the San Francisco Unified School District. I've evaluated their pilot over two years, the first year when they only had a few schools and didn't try and scale up towards any one school, middle schools, and then working with them in year two when they actually rolled it out to the entire uh, middle school curriculum. Um, uh, a little bit about you know bringing in um, big data analytics. <coughs> this was mostly to understand process, and I won't talk too much about this today. This was in partnership with Carnegie Mellon, thinking about how we might develop automated detectors for you know, children uh, working in block-based programming environments, how we might be able to you know, find what are unproductive or productive needs, and you know, formatively measuring it and supporting them. And also a little bit of multimodal analytics to understand their programming. So broadly speaking, most of my projects sort of look at all these aspects of curriculum assessment and pedagogy together, or what we might call the learning, the two pillars of, of learning, and all of these always need to be very closely aligned. It's difficult to work at all of these levels. Some people just focus on assessment, which is all right, but as learning scientists, it's, it's often very hard to sort of separate it all, and, and so, you know, um, you sort of jump in and, and, and take on the challenge of, of sort of looking at all of these things. So um, as I was thinking about what I might talk about today, as I was telling Roy, you know, uh, since I was talking, thinking about talking about learning sciences and how that impacts, I, I thought I should touch upon all three, three things. And I'm going to focus on two big ideas. One is balance and in pedagogy and sequence and curriculum, as being defined, and the other is around assessment and measuring what matters for deeper learning. I'm going to share a few ideas there and examples, and hopefully that will be uh, you know, fodder for conversation. So uh, talking about balance in pedagogy and sequence in curriculum, when we start to think about design or how to teach children some of these things, we have a body of research which shows what they stumble on and you know what, what, what problems they might be having. We sort of go back to learning, start with learning theory. And where do you start? I mean, uh, I, I pulled this out from somewhere on the web today. You know, there are so many, and this is probably an incomplete list. And I think it is also inaccurate because it has learning styles there. Let's not go there. We are all trying to sort of, you know, erase that from everybody's, you know, uh, consciousness. Uh, but you know, it, it it actually gives a fairly good spread of the kinds of things that we learn about in in the LSDD program and also in learning sciences. But when you sort of think about CS education, some of, you know, given that it involves a lot of computer science education, introductory computer science education involves programming and learning to program and computational thinking. And so clearly construct some, some sort of stand out very quickly. You know, there's constructionism, discovery learning, whether it works or not, may, it's, a, it's a question there, learning by doing. There needs to be, always needs to be some direct instruction. Um, some people may not agree, but I'm going to convince them that it is needed. Uh, given the space that we're in, there's a need for critical pedagogy. There's a need for social learning, which is a big part of, of the learning sciences. One of the big things that happened that the learning sciences did was, you know, starting with cognitive psychology and, and all these other fields that were well established, bringing in these social cultural aspects of the learning uh, environment into the frame. And so things like what, you know, Zone of Functional Development by Brodsky, scaffolding, Roy's 2004 paper being uh, a huge uh, you know, guideline for, for those of us designing technology, social technical systems. And um, 
And you know, so uh, it, it helps to understand the current discourse. Uh, so uh, the current discourse, you know, there's is issues of equity, empowerment, participation. And those sort of point for things like critical pedagogy, the need for student agency, creative expression, personal connections to learning. Then the, the reality is that popular tools like Scratch already have a certain you know, philosophy baked into them. There's a lot of, you know, they're very open-ended. They come out of a constructionist tradition and paradigm, you know, from Papert's world. Uh, and that privileges exploration of a building. So if you're going to use it in a classroom, you need to be doing something to sort of make sense of, of that open-ended environment. And so in general, the current CS education, for all these reasons, is sort of favoring tinkering, creativity, minimal structure. And, and oftentimes, the goal is engagement, motivation, personal meaning. I have come across research projects where the final outcome is only did the kid feel more excited or not about computer science. There is no learning there. But the reality is that we want to get to deeper learning. And positive affect is necessary, but it's an insufficient condition for deeper <laughs> learning. It's only one of those cogs there, perhaps. And so um, there, are, there is this other reality we need to contend with. 35 years of research, starting with some of the things that Roy and others did in the 1980s, where you know they documented very thoroughly the kinds of problems novice programmers have. And, and that minimally guided approaches often don't work, and especially for conceptual learning. And there is this idea that, you know, uh, not idea, introductory programming and programming in general basically has comes with a very high cognitive load because children are having to learn very different kinds. They're having to learn the syntax of the programming environment. They're having to learn the semantics of programming and understanding how to put together what is the problem. How do I even go about thinking about it? Should I break it up? How do I bring it together? And then there are these pragmatics of computing, which people don't often talk about. But there is how do you debug? How do you approach? How do you even approach this process? It's sort of CS folks know it, but kids need to learn it too. And so here, you know, you want to sort of balance that other slide with this other goal, with goal of deeper thinking and uh, uh, and deeper learning skills. And you know, preparation for future learning, uh, that's a phrase from Dan Schwartz and uh, John Branford's work, which basically looks at transfer, a new way of looking at transfer. But in our context, it should at the very least mean that if you learn programming, you should be able to sort of look at another programming language and try. you should see what you can do there more easily. You shouldn't just be learning scratch and how to put blocks together and learn the scratch programming environment. You need to be able to sort of maybe even do text-based programming more easily or, or other kind of programming that you learn. And, and some of our research has actually pointed to the fact that those naive conceptions that, that have been written about um, you know, uh, uh, in uh, with the Benedict Dubolet's work and, and several other uh, folks that, that talk about the difficulties with things like wearables and loops and things like that. The reality is that even though we've moved to easier block-based programming, and this these are all comments coming from kids working in Scratch, by the way, and, and these are their naive conceptions that they come with. They don't understand the idea of wearables. They uh, Sorry, this, there was another slide underneath, and this has some, you know, the transparency isn't working too well here. So, you know, even in introductory block-based programming languages like Scratch, many of the same misconceptions and issues are at play. And that's not surprising at all to most of us. It's only syntax that has sort of been taken care of by these block-based programming environments. And so when we think about all these sort of competing, uh, you know, uh, ideas or tensions, it feels like what one needs is, like you need a balanced diet, you need a balanced pedagogy. Um, you know, uh, don't follow that monocultural approach. Don't just, you know, a, a constructionist should be able to embrace other, other, you know, uh, pedagogies with with a view with a view to deeper learning. And folks that are that believe in more teacher-centered environments need to sort of be able to give up some of the control and think of student agency and personal meaning and things like that. Um, and the way I think about it is that it's not versus, it's about what time and when and how much maybe. And so these are all what might 
were what some folks might look at as competing or you know competing tensions but if you know you've got to think about all of them and just think about when and how much and what kind of all of this uh, you know you need to sort of design and engineer into your learning environment and so I have you know uh, given uh, given this a lot of thought starting with my work here at Stanford and, and some of the things that have influenced my work in, in these, in this one comes from sort of a psychology and the other comes from the social cultural, uh, you know, uh, work in the learning sciences, that there is a time for telling, you know, you, you, direct instruction is needed, but when in the sequence, and in fact, exploration before you, explanation has been done not just by Dan's group here, but also Roy and Paula Blickstein, uh, Dr. Schneider, sciences. Yeah. Uh, it's true in computer science, but it's true in science. In science, it's, too. It, you, the teachers who, who want the students to learn all the words before they experience the phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. And you experience the phenomenon, and even that experience, what should that exploration look like? How should we guide it? And there is that video of Dan's about telling too soon. In terms of in terms of instruction, if you want to think about explanation or direct instruction, there are many handy guidelines from the learning sciences about how you might do that. Make your thinking visible, uh, modeling, uh, you know, and cognitive apprenticeship. These have been used successfully in in spaces in other STEM disciplines where there is a lot of deeper conceptual learning. And when you think about uh, you know, a programmer, an experienced programmer, for example, actually thinking aloud and talking about how they go about thinking through a program and actually making those errors and debugging and, you know, it's, there's a lot to be learned in that process. And worked examples, there's a whole body of work that Mark Gusdial and his students have done around worked examples and sub-goals and sub-goal labeling and whatnot. These are just ways of reducing cognitive load. And, um, and scaffolding, when, how much should you support and, and, and when you should give it. And so uh, I'll give a couple of examples of how this has sort of showed up in my work in, in Foundations for Advancing Computational Thinking, which as I mentioned was this blended uh, uh, curriculum that was designed uh, with some online and as well as offline work and I don't expect you to read this, but given that it was my dissertation work, there was a lot of you know learning sciences uh, underpinnings there, starting with say you know how people learn, deeper learning, situated cognition, several others, expansive framing for transfer. That was something that I looked at. Analogous representations for deeper learning. I'm not going to go too deeply into all of that. I'm going to sort of just focus on a few things on how those things, how those ideas sort of. Uh, manifested in, in the curriculum and, and in the learning environment. And uh, I'm gonna focus on the modeling and modeling of computational problem solving and, and thought questions or guided inquiry before the modeling. So, uh, you know, uh, there were several features of the learning environment, but when, when, when one had to approach this task of of curriculum design, you sort of think at the, about the kinds of things that you could do as a teacher in the classroom with a given period that you have, say, 50 or 60 minutes or 90 minutes if it's a club, um, and you have time to, you know, demo, demo and, and lecture, so to speak. You could be having discussions either amongst the kids or with, if it's in an online environment, discussion prompts. They could be doing things in the programming, programming environment. You could sort of prompt them to, to sort of grapple with some thought questions. There's scratch programming, there are quizzes, you know, that you might want to give with, with feedback. And then there may be some extra activities for kids that may be moving ahead. And so one of the things that, you know, I had to engineer was, was thinking about these sequences on any given day and trying to think about how I might pre, uh, preface the demo or the lecture or whatever, with something that, where they've already explored in the scratch environment or offline with partners or individually. And I'm gonna give a very brief example given the time and how much I've been talking already. Um, but teaching loops and nested loops. So start with, you know, this kind of a game that kids play, you know, spirograph. These, 
there are these uh, spirograph like structures that kids can make very easily in environments like scratch they're basically nested loops or you know uh, i think some folks call them crystal flowers or something like that but uh, so my goal was teaching loops and nested loops for the kids it was let's you know our goal is to come up with cool shapes and let's sort of mimic those spirograph images and so you introduce this idea of a loop very simply most scratch most logo all of these sort of start with you know go forward turn right if you do that you first write that four times and then you say it's it's inefficient to write that there's you know you can do it more efficiently by using this repeat structure this repeat control and uh, block and so you show how to use a repeat first pair and then you demo how you might do multiple repeats around you know if you do it if you make one and then you turn around and you do it again and you turn around you copy that code and then you realize instead of copying code we could actually put this loop inside this other loop and so there's this so so those things are sort of demonstrated and then you let them play on their own uh, play with various sizes, tightness, colors, tightness of that spirograph, and 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 uh, shapes and colors and things like that. And then when you want them to move from a circle, from a square to a circle, that can also be a guided process. Instead of just saying, "How do you draw a circle?" which kids might never ever really figure out for themselves in Scratch, you basically teach them. You know, it's it's uh, if there was a board here, I could have. Is this a board? Oh. Anyway. Um, <laughs> it is everywhere except for the yeah window. okay it, it's fine actually it, it's basically trying to say if you if you go to a polygon shapes which have more and more sides you're basically covering more and more it's, it's beginning to look more and more like a circle and so you sort of let them work with their partner this was all actually in the curriculum so they they sort of sit with their partner and figure out how to draw five-sided six-sided eight twelve-sided shapes and how much they're turning and then you prompt them to sort of of see if there's a pattern that they're noticing there, the amount that they're turning, you know, for more and more sides and, and getting them to think about how then would they draw a circle. And, and you know, there was also this sort of, you know, activity where embodied cognition kind of thing, you can actually, how would you trace a circle if it was on the ground with, with your feet, which are straight lines. And so, you know, you're basically turning each time and you're tracing that. And so in the end, they realize that they really, if they turn one or two degrees each time, it would approximate a circle. And so, you know, there's basically this activity sort of interleaved with them trying things out in Scratch, thinking with a partner how they might do this. And of course, you know, at certain times, bringing the whole class together for discussion. So all of which is to say that it's a delicate dance that you're sort of planning and, and, and it doesn't work out right each time or every, you know, the first time. And that's what design-based research is for. You sort of try it out, you think about how things, and as a teacher, I guess you try it out with one class and then the next day you might change it around a little bit or with the next cohort of students. And, and, and so it, it's all about balancing, you know, this exploration with instructional needs and, and each time you're thinking about what kind of exploration, how is it going to be set up and when do you do it with respect to the instructional needs. And in terms of instructional needs, you could be doing modeling, which, which I, I talked about, um, or you could actually demo student solutions and discuss with the whole class, you know, what alternate solutions might be, actually debug a faulty solution. And so there's lots of things that you could be doing in what might be called direct instruction, but it's not always just telling. It's, it's you know, sort of provoking thinking and moving their thinking along. This whole idea of exploration before um, explanation we sort of took to a whole new level in this project. And, and I'll just talk about it really briefly here. We actually, instead of trying to pack everything into one classroom, you know, activity, we actually designed especially designed unplugged and digital activities, but not programming activities, which basically had kids sort of, you know, getting introduced to the idea of variables and expressions and, and loops in, an, in a context outside of, um, of programming. And then, so we thought of them as sort of sandboxes, but conceptual sandboxes. You know, what we realized is that in many computer science and programming classrooms, if kids <coughs> come up with questions, they're usually always procedural. It's very hard 
I mean, a conceptual conversation is very rare in a programming classroom. And that's where we wanted to sort of make, uh, you know, try something new out. And we were inspired by these, uh, you know, for our digital activities, we were inspired by dynamic geometry. We had the, we had the found, uh, not found, but the creator of Geometer Sketchpad as, as a co-PI on this team. So um, you Nick all know Jackie. Nick Jackie. And uh, he works at SRI, and um, uh, he also works for uh, Desmond, I believe, in the top end. And, uh, and so all of this was, again, with this goal of trying to get kids to think more deeply about these ideas. And I have a video here. I just want to share it really quickly. It's three minutes long, but it, we won an, an NSF, uh, uh, an award at the NSF mm -hmm. showcase with this video, so I thought it's a good way to describe some of the work that we did on this project. Can you understand? States, districts, and schools have begun to address the need to make computer science accessible for all K through 12 students. Most computer science classes focus on coding. When students rapidly code games, stories, and apps, they're motivated engaged, but how deeply do they engage with the underlying fundamental ideas of computer science? Research shows that without proper guidance, students don't often understand how moving programming blocks around the screen relates to computer science concepts. So to help all students learn programming and CS well, we're focusing on those concepts that pose problems for knowledge learners. Specifically, variables, expressions, groups, and abstraction. Well, for my students, developed curriculum helps them look more deeply at programming concepts. So what I found was that the projects that they completed, there was a complexity to it that um, hadn't been there before in, in my other classes. And um, it helped them be more intentional as well. We've developed a suite of digital and on-site activities for middle schoolers to learn the Bella concept. These activities help students explore the concept in increasing ways, and they complement introductory programming experiences in environments like class. For example, we treat variables and expressions as dynamic quantities, values that can change over time. This helps students distinguish variables in programming from the types of variables they've learned about in math class. We also use comic strip panels as a powerful non-textual metaphor to help students think about sequence and pattern and repetition, first in stories and then later in code. Our activities introduce abstraction as a technique for capturing something complex by giving it a simple name that becomes an operational shorthand for the thing itself, hiding all of its complexity. The activities draw on research and mathematics education, specifically on learning through dynamic representational technologies. To measure how well students learn these concepts, we developed formative and summative assessments focused on Bella ideas. We also conducted extensive research in three diverse middle school classrooms in San Francisco that implemented the Bella program. The teachers participated in professional development before implementing Bella in their classrooms. We're developing rich case studies from seven observations and 30 interviews with teachers and students. Piloting Bella was a great learning experience for me. I really appreciated the clear conceptual focus which students revisited in a related scratch lesson. We thank our team at SRI and our partners at the San Francisco Unified School District. And one interesting thing to note is that that teacher in particular felt that all teachers should go through that PD just to get that stronger conceptual focus, She, the, the PD. She felt that, you know, whether or not we use, and they are using some of these activities now broadly, um, in, in, as part of their CS curriculum, they've sort of integrated them uh, as, as uh, relevant in their, whatever their curriculum is. But this teacher felt that, you know, teachers should be learning this uh, because, because of, uh, you know, teachers are struggling with, with the deeper conceptual ideas of computer science and that's a reality that we all have to contend with. So parting thoughts on balance. Uh, I've come across a couple of interesting articles in recent days. By the way, Paul Kirshner is, is, is one to sort of, he'll find all the articles that show how direct instruction <laughs> works and works well 
even today and, and that active learning doesn't always work. And, and one of the articles that he shared was, it's not the right question to say, does it work? And it is, it is about when and for what and, and how, and how we could be combining con active learning with other types of learning and teaching to con significantly contribute to deeper learning. And another article that I came across very recently was in the context of really young children, probably the age that uh, Roy worked with when he was working on his PhD. But uh, this idea that you know, even when you provide a child, uh, you know, a little child, who we call little sponges because they learn everything, they don't always learn as it, some, some things need to be taught. And I think that that is just uh, the reality in, in for children as much as it is for um, the adults. So moving. Shifting gears to the other big idea now, which is talking a little bit about assessment and measuring what matters for deeper learning in the context of computer science and computational thinking. Um, my work here has been influenced by two, two uh, big ideas or two big uh, uh, pieces of work in, in the context of, uh, of assessment. One is uh, Bridget's work with, with Linda on powerful learning where she says, no, robust assessment for meaningful learning must include intellectually ambitious performance assessments that require application of desired concepts and skills in discrete ways. Contrast that to an open-ended project that is often you know, given as an assessment. Uh, rubrics that define what constitutes good work and frequent formative assessments to guide feedback to students and teachers' instructional decisions. The other comes from the deeper learning work, uh, and this is um, Linda Darling Hammond again uh, with I think David Conley, and they again mapping to those three aspects, big aspects of deeper learning. Assessments need to be touching on all of them, and and what I've realized is, is that assessments is basically a normative enterprise. You assess what you value, right? and 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 I think that we don't. We don't all too often. <laughs> All too often, and especially in the context of computing. I mean, we've had these conversations sometimes during the CS framework and AP computer science and AP CS principles that we value collaboration, but we don't know how to measure it. So shall we remove it from the program? You know, it's 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 basically this idea that, uh, and and yes, some things are more difficult to assess. Some skills are more difficult to assess. But if you value collaboration, if you value deeper thinking skills, if you value complex problem solving. And if you value creativity and everything that you value, it should sort of, um, you know, it, it's a signal to the learner about what's what's important in the learning process. And and so going back to the fact curriculum, there was a very elaborate system of assessments that sort of, um, you know, it, it, it's akin to what people call a portfolio assessment, maybe, uh, something like that. But there were directed and open-ended programming assignments there was innovative programming uh, assignments like Parsons Puzzles, which basically addressed this issue of not giving kids a blank slate, but give them jumbled blocks and have them put them together. Um, low stakes, high frequency quizzes, these are very useful, even as for a teacher to sort of uh, to understand where students are tripping up and, and not understanding certain things. Um, this included a summative assessment with multiple choice and open-ended items. I saw this, several of them from uh, the Israel national exam at the time. Um, the final pro project, there was one final project where it was open choice. You do it with a partner or individually. Because uh, you do want to value that part, student agency and, and creativity and, and creative expression. Final projects had to be presented and explained. In some cases, they had to sort of go in and explain to their class uh, classmates what you know how something was working. And uh, a studio final project on the Scratch website. Students artifact-based interviews. Now, this is not always possible. I did this as part of my research, but but it is valuable sometimes to just sit with kids and ask them what they're doing and why something is isn't there. And this was something that had been done in Bridget's project, with, I think with, with Eric, you and Bermuda, when mm -hmm. you did the, the work uh, back in 2000, the early 2000s. Uh, and of course, it's been used, it, it, even Karen Vernon and Mitch Resnick's work, they talk about you know, talk, speaking to children around their project that they had created and see what they, what they did, why they did. It also included a, a transfer assessment to 
see how well they could think about their film programming, even though they've been talked totally uh, in block ways. And of course, things like things that got at perceptions of their perceptions of computing and you know their experience there. So just to give a glimpse of what these looked like, these were sort of the you know thin edges for edX. And then there are several LMSs or even Google Forms that allow you to do things like this, where you basically you know you've got that spiral graph kind of thing, and you've got a smaller one. What what which of these blocks or which command is basically helping you change the size? Um, a mix of open-ended and structured uh, projects, but even the structured projects, I have to say, manage to sort of put in some choice. So, so you want them to think about sequence and serial execution. So make some life cycle of any kind, your choice, to teach a sixth grader in a science class. Make a spiral graph at any polygon of your choice. And so there was, you know, there was always the rubric that you gave always included some points for creativity and something that they added of their own in the project and that's how you sort of encourage that and some open-ended projects got with some structure similar to the way that quote from Bridget's work that they should be performance assessments but you have to make sure that they that they sort of demonstrate things that you want evidence of are able to give uh, evidence of, of certain things and then, of course, a completely open-ended project of choice, which is an often often a very popular kind of summative or formulative performance in in uh, introductory computing classrooms. These are some pictures. These are kids, uh, sort of they call the multiplayer game. They call kids, uh, you know, their classmates over to play and, and they, you know, demonstrated. There was a project showcase. Kids went and played each other's games and gave feedback. Um, there were artifact-based interviews. And this idea of, of open-ended family projects is something that I've continued since then. In my recent work with San Francisco Unified, I was looking at 80 open-ended projects that were done as, as, as um, their final projects as part of their middle school curriculum that I had nothing to do with. But I just wanted to see what is it that we can <laughs> learn from, from, you know, uh, completely open-ended projects. And, and, and the reason is that open-ended projects are given a lot of attention and, and uh, you know, they are significant because they are authentic and meaningful, there's creative expression, there's personal meaning, collaborative, performance, design, and presenting and sharing. And so there's this, you know, but, but I wanted to see what can they tell us in terms of what sort of constructs do they to do they, they use when they have choice in the kind of uh, you know things that they are doing? Are there differences and similarities by gender? What sort of artifacts students choose to create? And just for programming, I had some which were app inventor, developing MIT app inventor. And um, we designed a very elaborate rubric uh, to assess these, and that rubric is now open on, on Google uh, shared by the community at large, we presented this work at SIGZ this year. And one of the things we realized is we cannot really say from looking at an open-ended project whether they know a certain concept that doesn't show up. So if they don't know, if they don't use Boolean expressions, we did see, of course, that by, by you know, 60 projects had, you know, had, had there were like four or five that used a Boolean expression. So clearly there was something going on there, but then, you know, so for, for other concepts, uh, so that one we sort of could make a broad statement about. But for, for other things, if a student does not use it, do they know it, do they not know it? And so what, what another piece of work that I've been doing, and this is in the context of Alice, is actually designing programming tasks for measurement. And so using the evidence-centered design framework to sort of lay out what are the focal knowledge skills and attributes you want, and aligning them very, you know, uh, consciously to a programming task that is designed. And that's the work that we presented last year at AVIA. So that's that's one thought there. So uh, uh, we are now getting close to time, but I'll share one last example of assessments again, but this is in a very different context. And I did want to bring this context of computational modeling in the context of science uh, into this presentation. And so I want to share work that we're doing it's, it's a project in collaboration with Stanford, Dan's lab, and uh, Vanderbilt, Gautam Biswas's group, and SRI. Uh, and, uh, and here we are basically bringing in, you know, next generation science standards and what they have to say about 
of disciplinary practices and, and modeling and computational thinking and all the ideas that we sort of think of as CT in in, in a context outside of anything, you know, this this uh, uh, in a programming context pretty much. Uh, but what does this mean when we are integrating it? And so, you know, our design process that we followed uh, using evidence-centered design for both curriculum and assessment sort of has these integrated maps where we sort of look at the NGSS um, uh, uh, concepts and, and things, and then there's stuff that comes from the computational thinking and CS framework. And also there's work been done, uh, that's been done by Reed and Zelinsky's group around you know, frameworks for uh, integrating CT and math and science context, and then you know, looking at what in the end, what computational modeling would look like, and, and you have these integrated learning goals. And I just want to give a quick example of how embedded assessments look in that kind of context. So there's, again, a very innovative curricular experience where we are, again, grappling with the same kind of thing. What, where is the sequence? Where, where should we give them a conceptual model? When should we show them how to draw, you know, create a model? And here the programming environment is snap. Uh, which is a scratch-like language that has come out of Berkeley. And, and Vanderbilt, one of the co-PIs, Akush uh, Ledevsky, he uh, has developed an extension to um, SNAP called NetsBlocks, which is a very interesting extension that pushes it in several interesting directions. And so again, here, uh, you know, there is this idea of, of guided inquiry, conceptual modeling that leads to computational modeling. But the piece that I want to show here is this embedded formative assessments which show knowledge in use, and that is again something that comes out of the science uh, framework that integrates, you know, our, I've not forgotten what these science were. Science and engineering practices, programming concepts, and disciplinary core ideas. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there's a science learning person in the room, thank God. <laughs> science and and, and the idea, and, and, and Dan's group is sort of looking at when students learn science and physics in this way, what are the kinds of takeaways, you know, for preparation for future learning, for near transfer, and also for things like, you know, is, is there something, is, it is a different way, epistemologically different way of modeling, uh, you know, of thinking about kinematics, which is what you're working with you know, when you compare equations versus this. And so again, there's a curricular sequence, and I want to just give a quick example of the kind of curricular activities they do before showing an assessment. So this is the SNAP environment, and here they're trying to model a moving truck that needs to come slow down and come down, come to a stop at the stop sign. So there is a domain space, there's, there's also these kinds of things. There's, you know, you can look at a graph of position, velocity, you can look at values, how position is changing, how different things are changing. And, and th there's this idea of a domain-specific modeling language where blocks have been created that are physics blocks. So they have a velocity block, they have an update position, an update velocity. But those blocks then they sometimes have to code themselves. When we are modeling, we sort of pre, pre create them and show them. Sometimes they have to go in and change those and, and sort of model the phenomena. And the good thing is we, we in a recent study that we did at the Mount D. Adler School District here in California, we asked them, what, do you like this way of working with physics ideas more than, how, how do you compare it with equations? They, they actually said things like we can put in different values and just see what happens. So this whole idea of computational modeling, giving them a way to interrogate the phenomena with various inputs and outputs without having to sort of solve the equation again, they said, you know. So that is a faithful piece. But once you have the models, and of course visualization was another big thing. They said you can actually see what's happening. And so this is an example of an assessment, an, an embedded assessment that sort of comes from a very real world context. We have walkways at the airport and you know, how would your speed, how how quickly would you reach point C if you were to walk outside uh, of the walkway versus on the walkway? And, and for this, we give an incomplete task. Uh, so we model the person walking outside because they've already studied that. They've already studied constant uh, uh, velocity. And uh, so we give them that, but then they have to 
actually go into the code for the person who is stopped at the beginning of the walker and actually change that code to show how that this this is the piece of code that they need to change and 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 basically show how they would update the position in the simulation spec for the person and their walker. Um, so that is is pretty much all that I have put together for today. I have a couple of additional and parting thoughts. Um, I would have liked to talk about a lot more things, uh, especially this idea of context, especially this idea of computational thinking in different contexts. There is a lot of raging debate. Oh, if you're learning it in, you know, it is true that, you know, when you learn thinking skills, they are situated in the context in which you learn them. You learn them, you know, uh, it, thinking skills are not devoid of context. But if you want them to transfer, you need to mediate uh, for transfer. It doesn't happen automatically. And, and there have been a lot of studies that show that if you, you know, learn programming, you don't automatically become a good problem solver. But then if you need to, and with code perhaps, you need to make those bridges and connections. There are skills that definitely overlap between math and, and for example, math and, and CT and, and, and programming, but then, you know, it doesn't just automatically happen. Another idea that I want to end with is, you know, all this work, all of my work, you know, this idea of distributed intelligence that Roy wrote about relatively long ago in 1993. Um, you know, it's, it, all these teams have all kinds of people and uh, uh, contributing to them, not just learning scientists, but domain experts, classroom teachers, assessment experts, computer scientists, and um, I want to just broadly acknowledge the idea of multidisciplinary teams for this kind of work. Um, and uh, yep, so we can have some conversations now. Questions? I have two very uh, broad questions relative to your broad and interesting um, and very timely talk about uh, computer science approaches and thinking about them. I'm curious about your experience, maybe anecdotally, with the context of a Google Group Video Hangout uh, for learning. So the context moves out of the classroom to a kind of classroom online uh, that would be interactive real time, face to face, and then also in multiple languages. Uh, if it were to go into Hindi, or Japanese mm -hmm. um, as a context, so language as context, um, online space as context. Uh, what That's are your, interesting. these I'm are- I'm sure there are others who might be able to sort of uh, contribute to this, uh, to this question. Uh, I have personally not done, you know, a Google Hangout in, in this particular context, but I know that it is Skype and Google Hangouts are being used for just about every, everything these days. I do know that uh, somebody posted a, um, an article recently where, where in, in India, interestingly, uh, some courses were deemed not, uh, not appropriate for long distance learning and, and CS and technical education was one of them where, where there's a lot of doing and you have to sort of, uh, you know, be uh, experimenting and science might be, although there are things like remote labs too, you can do so some of the the, 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 the coaching part is rather uh, to try and I think there are, there are pieces of the activity yes. that function much better with a proximal coach, yeah. right? And that is how to achieve in the long run uh, facilitation. Yes. The manipulation of phenomena is another big problem for science. There's some things you can do in remote lab, yeah. some you can't. Yeah. And of course, everybody knows you can make the computer do anything. So if you want to find out about how the real world works, does a simulation really have the same impact right. as going out in the woods and looking? Right. 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 <laughs> right. But when I think about programming, I think there is this thing called live coding or, or modeling. It's sort of like modeling or sort of going through a work example. I think those kinds of things could be possible, uh, you know, with, with an instructor. Kids and, uh, learn to play Minecraft by going and finding videos of other people playing Of other Minecraft. people playing, that's <laughs> exactly <laughs> it, yeah, yeah. So I think there is potential there. It's again, comes down to sort of trying it out and seeing, you know, but I think, uh, you know. Uh, and in terms of language, interestingly, it's interesting you talked about, um, 
I, I was involved in, in creating scratch blocks in Hindi. Uh, this was back in 2007. I was in India, the scratch team came. I had met with Mitch uh, in, on a trip to the US. I was in India briefly uh, in Bangalore during those years and they came to this school in Bangalore and, and I worked with a Hindi teacher. And the Hindi teacher was, was good about, you know, was, was doing some very literal translations. And, and sometimes they didn't work because of the way, you know, the scratch block is phrased. Again, it need, you need context. You need to understand. Which don't that. actually have one in their relationship. They, they don't. They don't. It's interesting. Some, some things turned out to be much longer. You know, you needed more words than say move forward, you know. And, uh, but I, I, don't, I, I don't have any experience with people. I do know that scratches and, and snap and all of these have now been translated to several languages. And I think people are very successfully using them in Spanish and in Japanese. Um, so I don't think that's an issue. In general, I don't, you know, what, what experience is, you know, with text-based languages, that has not, that obviously didn't happen. C is C, no matter what, you know, and so. But for young children who don't for speak English, English yes. the fact that the words are English words yes. is a bad. Yeah. And not many words. So you get to, to learn those languages. Yeah, you learn them fairly quickly. My, my son was friends involved. friends hate the fact that color is spelled without the U. Without the U. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Me too. So I, 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 <laughs> I know. <laughs> when, during the One Life Talk for Child era, there was a, a button on a thing that you could actually see the code. And my son was involved in, in the project to make that button work in different languages yeah. so that kids yeah. could see. The words that Absolutely. made sense to them. Absolutely. Rather than the words mm -hmm. that. Yeah. No. But, and of course, for even younger children, they've gone to, you know, just using icons and things like that. Scratch Junior and that pre K project that I'm talking about, you're just working with, with symbols and, and no words at all because you cannot assume reading proficiency or any right. level of reading proficiency for three to five year olds. Um, so, yeah, for all those reasons. I have a very different kind of question, and that is, as computer science becomes a required subject in high school or at middle school for more and more states, and it's something that is either embedded into other curricula or a separate course, who and where, where did the resources and the team that you're talking about come from? It's a huge issue for some of us. We need more curriculum development teams to have all that diverse expertise yeah. to be doing the work, and we need funding for that yeah. work. Yeah. And there are very few resources for it, and very few such teams. And I imagine the situation in computer science is similar. Similar, but I think right now it's riding on a bit of a wave of you know attention and and, and NSF grants, which are and, and NSF grants, and even even Silicon Valley yeah. curriculum uh, development embedded in research curriculum, and yes, mm -hmm. and and right now, for example, and and the focus sort of keeps changing. Currently, they're focusing on actually getting it out, and so they changed from the STEM plus C program, which was mm -hmm. all about try curricula, try what works and doesn't yeah. work in this integration space that sort of moves funding over to, let's give all the money to CS for all research practice partnerships where they're actually having researchers partner with districts to yeah, roll yeah, out yeah. computer science and, and deal with the research questions that have a very direct bearing on implementation. And, and you know, there are times when- Which assumes there's a curriculum to go out with. Which assumes a curriculum, yes. And, and at the high school level, I think there is a fair amount of, of curriculum development that's been done that was funded by the NSF around PATCS principles and the Exploring Computer Science curriculum, which continues to receive funding. Um, but other, you know, I think uh, organizations have stepped up. Go.org, for example, designed a whole sequence. Google, I've heard recently at the workshop that we were there in March, uh, they are moving, they're so far, they've been sort of in the out, out of school space, uh, all their programs, but now they say, it was it was a vague comment, I have no details, but they said they're moving into the formal learning space. And I would imagine that maybe a curriculum that might be able to 
resources that exist. So, yes, the similar but the resources doesn't exist. Yeah, exist. yeah. But I think integration right now is it's being funded by the NSF for the most part. Uh, STEM and computer applications is being spent. Those are pretty much rewarded. When you actually look at how it plays out in schools, it's still a big gap between math teaching and science mm -hmm. teaching. It is. And engineering may be a thing. Engineering is a poor thing. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. 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 The SDE and my math colleagues, for sure. Yeah. We use it all as if it's all, you know. All right, let's take one more question and then we'll go to an informal setting. And we can continue to talk with you. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of new to this space of computational thinking and computer science, although I did some computer science as an undergrad. Um, so I'm wondering if you can say more about your interest in the field. And I'm sorry if, if I walked in late and missed it. Um, I am taking a class uh, um, in linguistic anthropology this quarter. Um, and one of the readings um, brought up this notion of like, uh, like if, you are, if you have been colonized, um, somebody that is colonized might say something to the effect of like, um, I'm speaking to you and like, but this is the colonizer's language and I needed to speak to you, you know? And I think like uh, computational thinking seems to be like a form, like a tool, right? But then uh, computer science, like at what point does it become like a specific like language that somebody owns or maybe never, you know, I don't know. It's a good question, but it almost feels like do we need, where, where computing is concerned, do we need, does there almost feels like a need for that kind of language or shared language, given that computing is sort of pushing innovation in almost all disciplines and computing is being viewed from our everyday social interactions yeah. to, it almost feels like everybody needs that language, but it also means that all voices need to be sort of playing a role in that, and that's mm. why this equity piece and this, um, you know, we talk about biases and algorithms and things like that. I think there is a need for multiple perspectives and multiple voices in there. Mm -hmm. But it, it sounds like, if I've understood your question correctly, it feels like the, the, the CS seems to be colonizing things. And it, but there, there is also in school systems some level of direction of industry colonizing the school, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so the thinking of that, is this another move of the computer industry to take over teaching in school? Yeah. Yeah. I think that there there are reactive there are. kinds of reactions as well as accepting kinds of reaction to initiatives that come from industry into mm -hmm. schools. Right. Whether the purpose of the action was in fact in service of the industry or in service of the school is becomes very blurred in the interpretation. It does, and, and uh, it also uh, has led in some ways to an expansion of the discipline. For example, ethics in computing, which is not a topic we've talked or talked about, and then recently the Chancellor has realized that they're sort of <laughs> behaving like colonizers and getting in everywhere, and they're impacting things for better or worse, mm -hmm. recognizing the worst part, and thinking about it, it, it's not just, I think some senator made that comment about Facebook, that, and it's very true that tech and CS folks, etc., for the most part, think about, can this be done? You know, they're right. always pushing the boundaries. They never stop to ask, should this be done? Which is why the humanities sort of play well, an important or role. Thinking about unintended consequences. Thinking about which unintended is what we're, consequences. What we're seeing in Facebook. Yeah, and, and I think in reality, perhaps, in reality, perhaps they knew all those and unintended consequences, and it was all very intentional, etc. It's all you know, sort of gone, yeah. Not I think intentional that's a, in terms of an yeah. excellent comment. Yes, <laughs> uh, we can all ponder it. We can uh, go to the informal. There's some questions out there. I'm sure people would continue to entertain these questions. Can you just think of one more time? 